All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, it's unfortunate that I'm a very long way away, but I hope that we can make the best of the um, opportunity. And I'll be on the phone after the talk to talk uh, directly and take your questions. So I'm going to talk about the Australian regulatory requirements for genetically modified uh, crops. We'll have a quick look at the regulation of GMOs in Australia and New Zealand. We'll look at the principles that underlie Australia and New Zealand's regulation of new technologies in general and uh, genetically modified foods. We'll look at uh, what the regulatory concerns are in, in regard to food crops in Australia. And then I'll do a case study of uh, a corn rootworm protected corn, which is an RNAi GM stack. And it covers a range of issues around recombinant DNA, stacking of events, and the new breeding technologies. But I'll start with the bottom line of where Australia actually sits in the uh, regulatory spectrum. Established a new biotechnology in food is regulated as a subset of recombinant DNA technology in Australia. Stacks of previously approved events are regulated as conventional breeding and do not need any further pre-market approval. In Australia's view, they are just a normal, conventionally bred plant, provided the individual events have previously been assessed. The regulatory or safety concern for GM is low to negligible at most and is less than for some types of conventional breeding. New technologies generally are even less of a concern. So some of the new biotechnologies are more precise and have less potential to cause uh, broader effects. So Australia views them generally as being of less concern. Scientifically plausible hazards are few, if any. Each event, however, is dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis and additional requirements can be uh, requested if we believe there is a specific concern that needs to be addressed. We specifically do not require and actively discourage the use of whole food toxicology studies. They're uninformative, unscientific, uninterpretable, and generally largely useless and probably unethical under most animal ethics regulations, and particularly those of Europe and Australia. We do not require analysis of endogenous allergens because the information is not useful in terms of the risk management of any new crop. So, why do we have this position? Alright, so Australian regulatory culture is a little different to some. We first asked, do we need specific regulation? The need for regulation is driven by both social, or by which I mean political, cultural and public confidence issues, and by and or by need to protect public health and safety. We do need to be aware that there are issues other than strict science that will influence the regulation. But in Australia, it's important to keep those regulations quite separate and to be seen to be separate and based on a specific issue, not to conflate or to join up issues that aren't actually related. Building public confidence and therefore acceptance of a new technology is an important and legitimate part of regulation. Excessive regulatory burdens, however, can undermine public confidence by reinforcing misconceptions or misinformation about hazards. So, general principles for regulation of new technologies. And this applies whether it's a new technology such as nanotechnology, traditional uh, breeding using different techniques, biotechnology, or the new biotechnologies. Ethical regulation is proportionate to the risk Excessive, disproportionate, non-science-based regulation is risk-generating, not risk-mitigating. Food security is a real issue as the world's population heads towards 10 billion. Loss of prevention of national technological capacity creates dependence on import of foreign intellectual property. That's an economic risk. Inhibition of national ability to address specific local critical needs also creates a risk in terms of being unable to improve the living standards of your own populations. Novelty does not equal hazard. It's important to regulate the facts, not the urban myths. Data requirements should address viable risk management options based on robust scientific analysis of potential hazards. We call this the value of information analysis. Data is necessary or justifiable only where the information has a material influence on outcome. Or that is, the risk management strategies that you will apply. So, what's the evidence? That's what matters. A precautionary approach is not necessarily precautionary. Objective is to have balance, proportionality, pragmatism, 
cost-effectiveness, impartiality, and most importantly, uh, scientific integrity. So we need to identify the potential sources of novelty. What's new, different, what's been manipulated? How new is it actually? Is it just more sophisticated than it was before? Is it actually different? Or is it just that we don't have the data to understand how it fits in the existing context? What specifically is new? Is there any new or just some more, small aspect of it? And we need to differentiate between novel and hazardous. So what data requirements do we have in Australia? Toxicology, we don't require data on whole foods at all. Now, if you introduce, uh, sorry, Toxicology, we don't have any data requirements on the whole food because there's not one credible study on whole food in rats has called into question the adequacy, sufficiency or robustness of safety assessments based on agronomic and or compositional data and the knowledge of the crop being modified and the transgenes function in that crop. Maybe a need, however, to test truly novel substances that are introduced. Right? So if you introduce a new pesticide metabolism pathway to get pesticide resistance. There may be metabolites that haven't been looked at before, then we may need some toxicology on those new metabolites. If we're introducing a new protein that's never been in the food supply before, yes, we might want some toxicology on that protein specifically. But then you conduct the study on the pure substance, not the whole crop. Insistence on animal studies not only does not promote public confidence, but actively undermines it. If these studies are really necessary, then there really must be risks. There is no role for uh, animal toxicity studies for intractable proteins, nutritional variation, or the vague discredited postulates of unintended unknowns. Uniquely in the field of toxicology, risk analysis based on in vitro, in silico, and process evaluation, principally agronomic and compositional analysis, is 100% concordant with and predictive of the outcomes of whole food studies in animals. But this reflects both essentially zero potential for accidental generation of unknown, unexpected toxic substances solely through gene insertion, and a high limit of detection of bioassays for unknowns of low toxicity. In essence, a rat is a very poor substitute for HPLC. OK, compositional analysis. <clears throat> Even the requirement for compositional analysis, with some certain specific exceptions, is highly questionable today. Hugely expensive. No evidence that it adds anything to public health and safety. Not one instance of agronomic or compositional data revealing risks for commercial GM crops not predicted from a knowledge of the parent line and the source of the transgene. There's clear evidence that the considerable variation due to environmental conditions generally exceeds genetic influence. During GM commercialization, backcrossing of a lead hybrid with parent eliminates more than 99.9% .9 of hybrid genetics repetitive selection for the introduced trait. So any unintended unknowns are being reduced with every back cross. Requirements for GM crops, but not conventionally bred crops, which have greater genetic alteration, is irrational, logically inconsistent, discriminatory, and therefore ethically questionable. This is an example of conventional maize, seven different varieties, grown in six locations over one year. And what we have here is analysis of a series of amino acids. And what you can see is there is a very high variability simply between one variety and another, one location and another. And this is true for almost any analyte you care to look at in conventional crops and also, of course, in GM crops. So variability is normal, natural, and not an adverse unintended event. So now we're going to look at a case study. Now look, this is a quite a complex case study. You can get all the information on this case study, including all of the data submitted by the original corporate uh, applicant to the Food Standards Australia New Zealand, and Australia's assessment of this application on our internet. Everything is in the public domain. This is a cornerstone of our risk communication strategy in Australia and New Zealand. Nothing is secret, everything is out in the open. Very few people want to look at it, but a lot of people are reassured by the fact that they could look at it if they wanted to. There's also a great way of sharing the resources and work of Fazans uh, by your own agencies by simply looking on the internet to see what we've looked at before and what our conclusions were. Okay. So, this plant <coughs> has tolerance to glyphosate from insertion of uh, CP4 EPS PS from agrobacteria. It's not novel, it's previously been assessed. Expression of the Cry3B1 gene from the Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a normal soil organism, is not novel, it's previously been assessed. And the protein that's expressed has actually been assessed in a full toxicology study 
for use as a conventional pesticide for broad acre spraying in the past and found to have virtually no toxicity in animals. But in addition to these two events, so um, <coughs> excuse me, herbicide tolerance and the expression of the BT gene, in addition to that, there is a corn rootworm resistance being expressed by a, a small RNA I which has been inserted into the corn. So we're going to talk about how we would assess this combination. So corn has a long history of safety. Insertion of various gene constructs in corn using recombinant DNA techniques has a substantial history of safety. The inserted protein expressing genes are well characterised and code for well known and characterised proteins that raise no safety concerns. No safety concerns and no real mold. Adverse unintended expected effects on the corn genome composition without agronomic traits is scientifically implausible and inconsistent with the massive amount of data on gene and genome plasticity in plants. Genome plasticity in, plasticity in corn is naturally very high and has never resulted in toxic corn. So the key novelty, therefore, is combined to the expression of the double-stranded RNA and its potential mammalian toxicity. So that's where we'll focus. So ingested double-stranded RNA, RNAi, and microRNAi may be taken up from the mammalian gut tract. Exposure to active RNAi is novel and unfamiliar territory. There's no history of safe consumption. Humans and other mammals may have double-stranded RNA or RNAi targets closely analogous to those of plants and insects, and double-stranded RNA active in insects may be active in higher species such as man. Systemic double-stranded RNA may have adverse effects. So these are the postulated or the theoretical concerns. So what data do we have to address those concerns, quite irrespective of anything the company may have provided? All right, so let's look at toxicity. These RNAs do not code for protein, so they do not introduce novel protein into a modified plant. Therefore, there is no novel protein toxicity to be an issue, so we can forget about that. There are no known allergic RNAs. Therefore, novel allergens are not an issue. Up or down regulation of endogenous substances are concerned. Well, it doesn't matter what technique you employ in plant breeding, that is always a possibility. So the first thing you'd want to look at is does the plant being modified naturally produce a toxin? And then you do an assay for those specific toxins to see whether they've been up or down regulated. But in this case, maize is well known not to have any endogenous toxins and a vast history or genetic alteration has never produced toxicity. So we don't have a much of a concern in that area either. There are no endogenous allergens in maize, so we can largely forget about that issue. All right, so what's the evidence for the uptake of RNA? There's one quite questionable study which reported uh, microRNA being taken up from the gut uh, and altering the expression of a mouse gene, which had an effect on LDL. However, we've not been able to, other scientists have not been able to reproduce those effects in other species, uh, nor have they been able to show uh, an alteration of LDL. So it's quite probable that that study is simply uh, erroneous. Studies of uptake of plants from all RNAs from food are negative. So there's, every food that you eat has large numbers and large quantities of RNA, and as you digest it, you produce small chain RNA. There is not uh, evidence available to show that that is taken up in any quantities that is physically capable of producing effect. And the uptake of those RNAs needs to be sufficient to overcome degradative enzymes in blood and so on and exceed the threshold for an effective dose. So it's not just enough to take up you know, half a dozen molecules. You need to take up enough quantitatively to exceed all of the processes in the blood which routinely uh, provide surveillance of the blood and remove larger particulates, proteins, uh, and other substances that are foreign. Qualitative uptake from payers patches, or intestinal M cells as they're called in humans, is plausible, but requires resistance to digestion and is not quantitative, very small quantities. The M cells are basically immune surveillance cells in the gut. They take up small quantities and immediately present it to the immune system, which means that anything that's presented will be very quickly degraded, particularly in RNA, which is readily degraded by enzymes and uh, macrophages. <coughs> So the weight of evidence in consideration of normal physiology indicates the postulate is improbable and implausible at realistic intakes due to multiple degradating processes. All right, systemic uh, double-stranded RNA may have adverse effects. Well, numerous endogenous small RNAs are present in plant and animal tissues, 
and our normal constituent of the human diet. Many of the small RNA present bone tissues are perfect or near perfect complementary to human and other mammalian genes. So in essence, if it could happen, we'd already be seeing it happening. There's no evidence to suggest that consumption of these RNAs are associated with adverse effects of humans. And so this is discordant with the postulate. So the evidence doesn't support the theory. It's the theory that's wrong, not the evidence. All right, absorption of small RNAs may be active. In the pharmaceutical world, they would love to have small RNAs that were effective in disease processes that could be given RNA. An enormous amount of work has been done to try and find these and without success. If efficacy in man requires specific manipulation of the RNA, to prevent normal breakdown processes, removing the double stranded RNA before it can observe effect, and it requires intravenous administration generally. So, extensive research in human medical fields has been unable to achieve the effective uptake, systemic distribution, and cellular entry of unmodified small RNAs by their oral route, further demonstrating how implausible it is for these uh, small strands of RNA to have any effect in humans when ingested. Do we have targets that could actually be susceptible to these RNAs? Activity is exceptionally species specific for RNA ions. It requires specific uptake and distribution processes that avoid digestion and degradation. For, double, for this particular RNA mediated gene suppression by ingestion requires efficient uptake by the midgut cells in the insect. In the core and root worm, Significant biological activity was only observed when the double stranded RS and RS DS RNA sequences were greater than or equal to 60 base pairs. 14 insect species tested, representing 10 families and 4 orders of related insects, only 7 insect species uh, were able to uh, be, show any degree of sensitivity. So it's highly specific even among insects which have the processes to actively take them up and the mechanisms to respond to that double stranded RNA. So very unlikely to be effective in humans. Even when species of the same family, the biological activity of the double stranded RNA, RNA was highly specific and constrained. So how much DS double stranded RNA is present? 0.1 nanograms per gram of grain of double stranded RNA normally is present. Less than one millionth of the total RNA present in the grain. Activity is exquisitely species specific, and a number of other beetles that were tested were not susceptible, and nor were any other in insects from the other insect orders tested. So we've got 0.1 nanograms per gram of the grain of the specific event that we put into the corn. If you ate a kilogram, that's 0.1 micrograms in total, 1.7 nanograms per kilogram of body weight, and that's lower than the threshold of toxicological concern for a genotoxic carcinogen. You would have to be extraordinarily active uh, to have any effect at all. In human clinical trials, less than 1% of DNA uh, oligonucleotide specifically modified to resist digestion was orally absorbed, so very low absorption. In rats, less than 0.1% of a 20 mer was absorbed. Intravenously administered single uh, small interfering RNA targeting P53 produced no acute toxicity when administered it. 200 and 500 milligrams per kilogram body weight, intravenously, no effect. In human clinical trials, intravenous doses of siRNA at 10 milligrams per kilogram was without effect. So without stabilization, the half-life in RNA blood is around two minutes due to breakdown by nucleases. All right, so conclusion. Amount of small RNA in GM crops designed to express it is low. The amount ingested from even large quantities of crop is in the low microgram range. Absorption is low. Systemic exposure is minuscule. Survival of bloodstream is very short. Even large quantities injected IV are without effect. Uh, SIRNA is highly species, species specific. So the potential for adverse effect in mammals from ingestion is negligible and essentially zero. So what needs to be regulated? Well, we need to look at the gene construct itself the absence of extraneous genetic material, where the gene has come from, and so therefore what else it might have brought across with it. Does it affect the pest or the plant itself? If plant metabolism affected, can this impact critical compositional characteristics? Uh, the plant being modified, does the plant <coughs> being modified produce a natural toxin? If yes, we need to look at that and see whether that has altered. Is the consumption of small strands uh, RNA by humans normal? No. 
Can short chain RNA be toxic or pathologic? No, the evidence today says that's not likely. Is RNA IU? No, it's in our food supply already. Is the manipulation of RNA on food RNA I in food crops new? No. Conventional manipulation of crop plants is achieved agronomically desirable for incidental phenotypical alterations by accident, which involved RNA I. So classical toxicology has very little role in gene crop assessment, certainly in Australia. We don't do whole food studies. Uh, we look at the characteristics of parent crop. We look at the, the transient itself. We consider uh, if there's any novel proteins that are being produced or changes in metabolite profiles, and we focus our risk assessment on those specifically. And some references for some of the material I provided are here. And in conclusion, just let me say that although I was previously with Fazans, all my comments are my own, and I'm not authorised to speak formally on their behalf. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take questions.